How's it going, everybody? So recently, we've talked about the effects that island habitats can have on the evolution of different animals. Quite a bit, actually. We covered when the Mikasukid land crocs became tree-dwelling iguana-sized animals in New Caledonia, when the sloths hid away on Cuba from the quickly changing world that was ending the reign of their mainland cousins, and we just started to dabble into the giant evolutionary experiment that was Cretaceous Romania, or Hatsag Island. But now, upon my patron's suggestion, it's time to talk about another one. And this creature is one that took adaptation to an island environment in a completely different direction than what we've talked about before. Because everything we've talked about already involves big animals from the mainland arriving on an island and getting smaller to survive. But this thing is the exact opposite. The biggest, heaviest member of the clade Dinosauria since all the famous ones died at the end of the Cretaceous. The Apiornithids, also known as the Elephant Birds. We'll get into the somewhat complex story of how these behemoths came to be. A story that has really only recently started to come into focus in the past couple of years, with our growing understanding of this animal's genetic code. So we definitely have a lot to talk about. Before we can really get into the story of the elephant bird, we first have to understand the world that it calls home and how it got there. The third largest island in the world, Madagascar. In addition to the size of the landmass, the other noteworthy thing about Madagascar is that it's also the oldest island that we still have today. It's separated from mainland Africa during the Cretaceous around 70 million years ago. So even several million years before the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. And at that time, there were dinosaurs here just like everywhere else. And just like everywhere else, 66 million years ago, the slate got wiped clean of many of the large animals. So, going into the early Cenozoic, there were no giant birds here. They, like most of the unique fauna here, migrated during later periods. And that means that the ancestors of the elephant bird had to have a way to travel here. And that has always been pretty confusing for scientists when you consider their family tree. A group of birds called the Paleonathids. Or more specifically than that, the Ratites. This group is made up of animals that may not be all that surprising at a glance. Things like the ostrich, the rhea, the emu, and the cassowary, as well as the now extinct moa of New Zealand. But think about this for a moment. If these birds are all related, how did they manage to spread to Africa, Madagascar, Australia, New Zealand, and South America? The easiest way for any group of animals to cross oceans would be to fly. But one of the main things that all these birds have in common is that they are all flightless. In the past, we assumed that this meant that all of these animals shared a common ancestor who had already evolved to be flightless, and passed that trait down to all future ratites. The issue is that this would require their common ancestor to have existed when all the land masses of the southern hemisphere were still connected or at least close enough to not have to cross a vast ocean to get from one place to another. And that's where this theory starts to fall apart, because the last time that these continents were all one was during the Mesozoic, long before the first ratites ever existed. It is now believed that this group of birds all evolved flightlessness independently from one another. And this seems like a pretty big coincidence, but not really, if you think about how many times other kinds of birds have migrated to new lands and lost the ability to fly. And another question is, where did this group of birds actually get their start? Everybody assumed that it must have been one of the land masses that I already mentioned. But once again, this would prove not to be the case. When a skeleton of a bird called Pseudocryopterus was found in, of all places, the Green River Formation in Wyoming. And the age of this formation lines up perfectly with our estimates of when the first members of this group evolved. So it seems that the Ratites got their start in early Eocene North America. They were still able to fly at this point and spread across the world, possibly adapting to many different niches in the hot tropical climate that the entire globe was experiencing. By the Oligocene, the Ratites were doing much better across the Southern Hemisphere than they were in the North where they originated. And then, 
In several different waves, these birds would radiate out of Africa, first arriving in South America, and then another group would start to head east instead. By the late Oligocene, they had already arrived in Madagascar, and some would come to colonize this island, and still others would continue spreading eastward. By the Miocene, eventually arriving in Australia, New Guinea, and New Zealand. And every time that they would arrive in a new land, they would grow to a larger size and give up their ability to fly. But why? Why on earth would any animal ever want to do this over and over again? And how did this lead to the elephant bird becoming the biggest bird to ever live? In the past, we've talked about the effects that islands can have on large-bodied animals like mammals and non-avian dinosaurs. In many cases, it leads to smaller body sizes that will allow animals to survive with more limited resources and a closed-off ecosystem. But we see something different in many different species of birds in particular. And the reason why is that in many cases, the birds have a tendency to be the first ones to colonize a new region that's cut off by oceans. They get there before many of the mammals even have a chance. So they get the choice niches that on the mainland would normally be getting filled by large mammals. And the lack of large predators is one of the things that makes the biggest difference. With no cats or other things around, this gives many island-dwelling birds the opportunity to get larger and lose the ability to fly. After all, flight is very expensive in evolutionary terms. Whether it's a bird, a bat, an insect, or a pterosaur, everything about these animals has to be geared toward this one thing, getting off the ground. And with island habitats, birds have the opportunity to put some of those tier zoo skill points into other things. By the time mammals tend to get to islands, birds have already filled those dominant niches in an already limited environment, so they go the other way and get smaller. We see this in many different island birds that aren't ratites at all, both extinct ones from the past as well as ones that are still around today. But by far, this was the most extreme example. These birds likely grew to this size because they had no predators on this half billion square kilometer landmass. If this island had been smaller, they probably wouldn't have been able to grow quite as large, but they would have still likely become flightless. Madagascar was the sanctuary that was able to create the elephant bird. And the dimensions of this animal were truly something to behold. At around 3 meters or 10 feet tall, it wasn't all that much taller than an ostrich. But it weighed 730 kilograms or 1600 pounds, making it over 5 times heavier than an ostrich. So it's like a beefcake ostrich. Even conservative estimates put smaller individuals of this animal around half a ton. And with all that extra weight, it's probably safe to say that this animal couldn't move like an ostrich. Which makes sense, since ostriches live in a more open habitat and, as you probably know, do not live in a predator-free environment. And another interesting thing about this animal that this paradise allowed for was for this big bird to reproduce by laying the biggest egg ever. Full stop. There are dinosaurs who weighed almost 140 times as much as the biggest elephant birds, whose eggs were not as big. For comparison, I recently had the opportunity to visit my friend Ashley, whose house is basically a museum. And within her collection, she has a reconstructed elephant bird egg, along with several eggs from its fellow ratite relatives. And I was allowed to get a look at them to get some comparisons. Here we have eggs from a rhea, an emu, a cassowary, and an ostrich. And as you can see, when you compare them to the egg of the elephant bird, well, there is no comparison. This egg had a two gallon capacity, and they got by being able to invest so much into these giant eggs because they had nothing to fear. The elephant birds of Madagascar continued this way ever since their ancestors arrived in the Oligocene, getting bigger and bigger in their isolation. And these giant birds even survived the end of the Ice Age. And by the time we get to the Holocene, they had evolved into three separate genera. Mullerornis, which was the smallest, Apiornis, which was the most widespread and abundant, and the massive Varambe, 
who was actually reclassified in 2018 from being a species of Apiornis to an entirely new genus representing the biggest bird to ever exist, Varombe Titan. But unfortunately, despite all this success, following the end of the Ice Age, the expansion of a mammal distantly related to the lemurs that the giant bird shared their home with would begin. And everywhere they went, the large animals that once ruled would fall into extinction. Considering the expansion of Homo sapiens started in Africa, it's pretty surprising how long it took for our species to arrive in Madagascar. But when we did, it was probably the same story that we've seen many times before. For many animals across the world, our involvement in their extinction is undeniable. Even if we were not 100% the sole cause, the introduction of a new apex predator at the time when we were expanding was the last thing many of these animals who were probably already struggling needed. But, in the case of the elephant birds, it doesn't seem quite that cut and dry. For one thing, we have a hard time pinning down exactly when people first arrived on the shores of Madagascar, most estimates putting them around 4,000 years ago, some even earlier than that. And if that were the case, that would mean that humans did live alongside these giant birds for a very long time. Normally, when humans arrive in a new land, the evidence of predation includes things like bones that show signs of being cut with tools, perhaps signs of being cooked on a fire. And although we do see many different animals like lemurs and pygmy hippos with these signs of butchering, we don't see nearly as much elephant bird remains as you would expect. Perhaps this titanic bird was looked at with some sort of reverence or fear by the early people of the island. And coming from someone who has actually been kicked by an emu who had a messed up leg and kind of walked funny, I get it. If you scale that up to an elephant bird, I'd have been like... Is that it? Is that all you got? So yeah, people probably kept their distance. But what we do know is that people did go for their eggs. And considering you could feed your entire family with just one egg, it isn't surprising at all. But perhaps because of this reverence or fear, the first people of Madagascar kept this thievery to a minimum. Because there appears to be a pretty long period when humans and elephant birds coexisted. And considering how much these birds seem to live on in the cultural memory of the people of Madagascar, there had to have been a lot of interaction. Another factor that probably kept the humans and the birds apart for a while was the way that these birds lived. In addition to the fact that they lived in more dense forests, it's also now believed that the elephant birds were nocturnal. But unfortunately, some of this would be their undoing, because Madagascar was getting drier and the forests were starting to vanish. And this is when the human presence on the island would start to make a much bigger impact. Because now, every tree cut down to clear land was building towards an ecosystem collapse. And on top of that, humans also brought with them domesticated birds like chickens and guinea fowl. And there is a theory that these birds may have brought diseases that the elephant bird did not have any immunity to. And if it seems like I'm spitballing here, that's because I am. The reality is that all of these theories have evidence to support them being the cause of the elephant bird's extinction. But unfortunately, we don't really know for sure. In fact, we don't even know exactly when they died out. Our best guess is that the last of them were gone around 1,000 years ago. But... Sightings of a giant bird, like the one reported by Christopher Columbus in the south of the island during the 15th century, suggests that remnant populations may have lasted until much later. The elephant bird is one of those animals that we only just missed being able to see alive. And it's a fascinating study on how island habitats can affect the evolution of animals that call those environments home. It's also such a confusing animal. Just because of everything with its history and what, everything that we do and don't know about it. 
And to make things even more confusing, in the past decade, we've been able to sequence the genome of the elephant bird from sub-fossilized eggshells. And we were able to figure out which of the ratites was this animal's closest living relative. And that might be the most mind-blowing bit of all. Because it was found to be none other than New Zealand's humble kiwi. That's right. This furry football with a long beak is actually the closest thing to an elephant bird alive today. In fact, the kiwi is closer related to the elephant bird of Madagascar than they are to the moas that they used to share the island of New Zealand with. And as hard as it is to believe, if you think about it, and maybe squint really hard, you can kind of see the resemblance. Like the elephant bird, the kiwi is nocturnal and it also may retain a rather unfortunate feature from its long-lost cousin. For you see, this is a kiwi skeleton. And this is a kiwi skeleton that is gravid, or about to lay an egg. These poor birds lay an egg that is approximately one-fifth their body mass. For context, ladies, that would be like you giving birth to a child that at birth is the size of an average six-year-old. So hats off to the kiwi. Islands really do produce some of the most remarkable animals the world has ever seen. And this has been the case all throughout time. Each one a self-contained experiment in evolution. So much so that it was the study of these habitats that first sparked the theory of evolution in the mind of Charles Darwin. And because of this, as well as a great deal of fascination on the subject by my audience, I have asked my patrons if they would like to start assisting me on a monthly project. I want to cover everything about the phenomenon of island habitats and the ways that they drive evolution. Whether that would be deep dives into specific animals that evolved on islands, full videos talking about different island ecosystems, and even the driving forces behind these different unique evolutionary paths. I think it'll be a lot of fun, and it's easily the biggest project that I've considered since the ongoing History of the Earth series. So, assuming the patrons deem this project worthwhile, that will be beginning with the first video of next month. Projects like this are only possible because of the support provided by our patrons. And now that there are over 100 soldiers in the Army of the Goo, we can now start going on adventures like this. So thank you to all the patrons who make things like this possible. But not just them. Everybody who watches these videos has a hand in keeping this channel going. And for that, I thank you all. Alright Tim Tim, you ready to sail off to an island adventure? Does that mean I can eat more of these giant eggs? Tim Tim, you asshat! That was the last one! Uh-oh. Uh -oh.